morning. I always uh, enjoy hearing the baby announcements. I, I did a, a rough count, or I had asked Crystal to do a rough count. I think since the end of September, that's uh, six babies for a total of 12 so far this year. And I'm always interested to hear the names of the babies and what are the trends, what are the popular names, and sometimes I've heard of the names before and, and other times they're totally new to me. Names are important. Names are part of how we identify ourselves. and sometimes I hear a name and I'm like, is that for real? Like, is that really that person's name or is that a, a nickname? So I did a little bit of, of research, and you want to click on that, Graham? I did a little bit of research and, and found there were some very interesting names. So if your last name is Register, I can see the temptation. Uh, let's see if we can get to the next one. You might have to click for me. Yeah, now that one doesn't need any explanation. That one's just funny. Keep going. So that is uh, Janice. Uh, how, how do you say that? If you can say that name, you get a prize. So I did some research on that name. I thought, is that for real? So this person lives in Hawaii and apparently got a letter from the Hawaiian government saying uh, their, their computer system only allows for 35 letters in a name and she has 36. Would she mind abbreviating it? Guess what she said? No. <laughs> go to the next one. That one's kind of funny too. Crystal ball. Let's go to the next one. So if you're a, a Star Wars fan and your last name is Knight, I mean, you pretty much have to, right? Jedi Knight, I like that one. So there are some interesting names. Have, have you ever met someone who had the wrong name? I mean, you, you met them. I, I have a, there's an acquaintance. Uh, his name is James, and I'm like, that guy is not a James. That is just the wrong name for that person. Sometimes we have an image in our head or, or an idea of what a person's name should be, and it's hard to, hard to change it. In ancient times, names had meaning. It said something about you. Over the last several Sundays, we've been in a, a series on the names of God, so we want to continue with that. Some of the names of God have surprised me. For example... Last month, Pastor Daniel spoke on one of God's names. His name was Jealous. Have you ever called God Jealous? Have you ever prayed to Jealous? Have you ever praised Jealous? I mean, that's not a name that we really use. It's a, it's a very interesting name, but, but names say something about the person. God is Jealous. He will not take second place in our life. So there's an example of a, an interesting name that has power behind it. Today's name is one I have never used before, and maybe it'll be new to you as well, and it's only used three times in the Bible. So let's dig down and let's learn why this is an important name. Let's pray before we open our Bibles. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have brought us here or online. We thank you that we can come together, we can, we can learn, we can worship together through music, and now here, Father, as we open your word that you've preserved for us, Father, I pray that it'll speak. Your word is a double-edged sword, and so, Father, I pray that it will speak to us, that your Holy Spirit will convict, encourage, challenge. Lord, you know our hearts, you know us as individuals, and so I pray that this will lead to a deeper experience with you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So this unique name is used only in the book of Daniel and only in chapter 7. So if you have a Bible, I'm going to ask you to turn there with me. Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. And the book of Daniel is written by a prophet named Daniel. And he, Daniel and many of the Israelites were, uh, were taken as exiles to Babylon from Israel, and this happened when, when the Babylonians came in and God used them to punish the Israelites and to destroy Jerusalem. Daniel, along with others, were, were taken by force to Babylon. So that's where the book of Daniel is written from, from Babylon. It, it's written in the 6th century B.C. The first six chapters of the book of Daniel contain all kinds of amazing stories. Maybe you've heard some of them before. There's the story of Daniel's three friends who are, who are thrown into a fiery furnace. There's the story of God's handwriting on the wall as a warning or as a, a, yeah, a warning to a king, we could say. And there's also 
the, a popular story about Daniel being thrown into a den with lions. So that's all in the, the first six, kind of the first half of the book. But from chapter 7 on is a story, it records four visions that God gives Daniel. So the story we're looking at is one of those visions in chapter 7 of Daniel. And our goal is not to study the visions. Rather, our goal is to look at a story within, and well, actually, our goal is to look at the name of God within that vision. So that's what we'll do. Uh, these visions that we're going to read, they're a scary image. It's a scary image of a beast. I, I thought of putting them on the screen and showing you a, a, an artist's interpretation of what it might look like, but I thought, ah, I don't want to get that image in your head. It's, it's like a, a sci-fi movie. These strange images, and this is apocalyptic literature that is meant to, uh, to form prophecy using symbols and sometimes very strange symbols in order to, for example, predict the future or to predict destruction. So this vision of Daniel's is a metaphor not to be taken literally. And, and just a note, thanks for Daniel for uh, uh, just promoing the... Uh, this, Saturday, this Friday when Phil Powers is here, he's going to be speaking on apocalyptic literature. He's going to, and this, this passage right here, along with others in Daniel, he'll look at Matthew 24, he'll be looking into Revelation, all in a study on end times. So I hope you will take that in. So back to Daniel's vision in chapter 7. It is intended to give hope to the Jewish people despite their bleak situation as exiles in Babylon. So this is Hope in a Bleak World. And that's the, the title of my message, as you can see from in your bulletin. And I believe that this hope extends all the way to us here through the name that we're going to study in our story. Why well, cannot get this thing to work? There we go. So let's get into the story. Verse 1, Daniel chapter 7. In the first year, Belshazzar, king of Babylon... Sorry, I'll read that again. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions passed through his mind as he was laying in bed. He wrote down the substance of his dreams. So let's stop right there. This is still important because this, this, sets, this helps to prove the historical accuracy of Daniel. And not only that, we see, we also, also realize that the book of Daniel isn't exactly in chronological order. Now, the first thing that we see, verse 1, it says that in the first year of the Babylonian king, Belshazzar, which scholars believe to be about 55, or sorry, 552 B.C., is when he started his reign. But two chapters earlier, in the book of, uh, still in Daniel, chapter 5, we read how Belshazzar was killed when the Medes, the Medes and Persians invaded Babylon and killed Belshazzar, and that is around 539 B.C. So we can see that part of this vision actually takes place, uh, will take place about 13 years later from when he is writing this. So let's keep reading. Verse 2, Daniel said, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me were the four winds of heaven churning up the great sea. Four great beasts, each different from the others, came up out of the sea. Now remember, this is symbolism. So the sea represents humanity or the earth. The churning represents turmoil or rebellion. And, and so we put this together and it shows that there's great unrest. And from that unrest, four beasts come out. And in verse 17, an angel explains to Daniel what this means. And he says, the four great beasts are four kings that will rise from the earth. So they represent kings. And then Daniel goes on to describe each beast. And scholars have connected these beasts to, to different uh, uh, kingdoms in the future, in his future, our past. And that's not our focus, but I will skim quickly over each of these beasts. So the first beast in verse 4 is like a lion, and many scholars believe that's Babylon, so the time when Daniel's writing this. The second beast is a bear, which many scholars connect to Medes and Persians. The third beast, verse 6, is a leopard, which many say represents the Greeks and Alexander the Great. 
And then the fourth beast is different, verses 7 and 8. It doesn't represent an animal, but it's the scariest of them all. And some have connected this to Rome. And I have a question mark there because not all Bible teachers will accept this beast to nation association. Some would say that fourth beast is the Antichrist, making it in our future. But we'll leave that. That's not our concern today. We're looking for the names of God, and we'll see that in this passage. So let's keep reading. Verse 9. As I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, the hair of his head was white as like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. A, f- a river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated. And the books were opened. Daniel is visualizing this supreme court scene in heaven. And here we find another name for God. Ancient of days. You ever called God that? What does that even mean? There's a verse in Isaiah chapter uh, 43 verse 13 that reads like this. It says, yes, and from ancient of days I am he. And another translation says, from eternity to eternity, I am God. Ancient of days speaks of God who is eternal. That is who it is referring to here in this passage. And we see in Genesis 1, if we go back, there we go. In Genesis 1, if we go back in time, God created. He made Light and day. He made day and night. Therefore, God existed before days were created. God existed in eternity past. He has always existed. No one existed before him. There was nothing before him. The alternative is God doesn't exist, which means God didn't create. And if you and I are not created, that means we're just a chemical accident. That means we're just a product of time and chance. Instead of discovering God's truth, we'll just make up our own truth. We'll just determine our own value system. We'll determine our own purpose in life. We'll make up our own moral rules. But what happens when my morality conflicts with your morality? And we see that today. You can have protests and you have counter-protests. Exactly the opposite. Fighting with each other. Whose morality takes precedence? If God didn't exist in eternity past, then there was nothing before this world. And wouldn't it stand to reason then that there's nothing after this world? So if I came from nothing, and I'm going to nothing, wouldn't that mean that there is really nothing in the middle either? If you are not created by God... If you're not created by God, then your purpose is something that you will make up for yourself. And let's say that purpose, you make up a purpose and you you begin to, let's say that purpose is something like uh, feeding the hungry, or let's say it's something like, yeah, stopping war or stopping racism, or or maybe it's uh, eliminating homelessness or or helping those who are vulnerable, all of these social justice issues which are worthy causes and and even biblical. But if that is the point or the purpose of your life, what happens if you're not successful? Has your life just become pointless? Who cares about values, right and wrong, if life has no purpose? I met a guy recently who had, who had just moved to Hague, and I was in my back alley, and uh, he came by, and so I was talking with him, and, and I live right by a graveyard, so the segue was really easy. I just said, what do you think happens when we die? I asked him. In other words, is there anything after this world? And he said he didn't think so. So I asked him, what's the purpose of life? And he thought it was just, you know, do your best to be happy. That reminds me of King Solomon. King Solomon, if happiness is the purpose of life, he should have been the happiest guy on earth. 
He could have anything he wanted. The richest, most powerful person, and yet he said, it's all meaningless. He even wrote a book about it. Ecclesiastes. You check it out. If being happy was my only purpose in life, I would be extremely selfish. Everything I do would be about benefiting me. Let's say I'm successful. Let's say I actually am, live a happy life, everything I want. So what? So what? What would it matter? What? If, it's, if all whole life is pointless and I live my less than 100 years and I die and that's the end of me, so what? I like this verse in Revelation 1.8. I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. The Alpha and Omega are the first and last letters in the Greek alphabet. So it would be like saying, uh, like God is saying, I am the A to Z. Right? It's basically the same thing. He, he's always been here and he always will be here. Our finite minds, I know we, have a t we, we can't comprehend such an important doctrinal truth but since God has always existed, He is responsible for creating us. That means that this life has value. This life matters. God created us with purpose. The purpose of humans is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. How do we do that? How do we glorify God? We respect and obey Him. We get to know Him more intimately. We remind ourselves that we are only temporary residents here on this earth. And so we anticipate Christ's return and our eternity in heaven with Him. So, so far we have learned, what have we learned about the Ancient of Days, that name? It, it speaks of God's as eternal. And that's a wonderful doctrine or a, or a wonderful truth because it means that we didn't come into this world by accident. Our life now has purpose. There is life after this world. We as Christians will live and reign with Christ forever. So when the concerns in this life get you discouraged, I want you to remember this name, Ancient of Days, and remember what it means. God is eternal. He created us, therefore we have purpose. God will always exist. God knows eternity. There is life after this world. And that gives me hope when I listen to the news and it just seems so bleak, unrest and dysfunction and, and resistance to biblical values and injustice. Remember that name, Ancient of Days. So let's continue in our vision back in Daniel chapter 7. Daniel sees the Ancient of Days take a seat in this, this courtroom scene and we see this, this image in our mind of this courtroom turning silent and all eyes fall on the Heavenly Father. And it reminds me of a scene last month, Martha and I were in the Dominican Republic on a missions trip. And it was a very different experience, and I've mentioned, told this to some of you, but it was, it was a, the target audience was the corporate world. It was leaders in business, it was influential people in Santo Domingo. And through the ministry of, of our team, we saw 15 people commit their lives to Christ. It was pretty exciting. I accompanied one of our speakers when he went to speak at a, a business. It was a, executives at an electrical utility company, similar to our SAS Power. So when we arrived, they ushered us, us into this room, this big board room, and there's this huge board table sitting there, beautiful table with these big leather chairs all around, like little thrones. And that was our chair, and the other people sat on these plastic chairs, and I'm like, you know, we... I'm just tagging along. I don't need to have a nice chair. But anyway, they really honor their guests. So we, we sat there, and the rest of the people were kind of milling around and talking. It was time to start, and all of a sudden from the back door, this guy in a red shirt walks in, and he's, all, he's got gray hair, and he sits down, and instantly, it was quiet. And I thought, i got to get me a red shirt. <laughs> it wasn't about the shirt. This was El Presidente. This was the boss. This was the guy who had position and power. And I thought of that scene as I was reading this. 
this, this amazing, huge uh, judge comes in and sits down on the throne and all the eyes turn to him and everybody is silent, everything is quiet, and there, there's no more chaos like we have at the beginning of the chapter. It's control. There's calm. The all-powerful is now on the throne. Daniel goes on to describe God, and you can see that he, he describes him like this. His clothing was as white as snow. The hair of his head was white as wool. Okay, now remember, these are symbols. This isn't actually what God looks like. John 4.24 tells us that God is spirit. White cloth is a symbol of absolute purity, holiness. And white hair we associate with age, right? So there's this implication of wisdom, the eternal nature. And then it says, <coughs> excuse me, it says that verse, uh, the next verse says, His throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. And in Scripture, fire is a symbol of judgment. So we have this judge. He has power. And he's not intimidated by these kingdoms that are around him, these powerful kingdoms of earth. In reference to that, the burning wheels, one commentator says that it was common in the ancient Near East that for thrones of kings and gods to be on wheels, which seems a bit strange to us, but perhaps these burning wheels meant uh, symbolize swift judgment. And that makes sense when we couple it with the, the next part of the verse, verse 10, which says, a river of fire was flowing, coming out before him. So there's this picture of judgment poured out on the wicked. And then it says, thousands upon thousands attended him or served him. So likely referring to angels just ready to serve or follow the judge's orders. And then it says, 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. If you do the math, that's 100 million. I don't think the point is there were 100 million there. I think the point being... And one of the commentators says that this is the highest number which ancient people had a word for. So the point being that it was a large number. Of what? Of whom? Are these more angels? Are these representatives of the kingdoms of this world? Like some teachers that I, I read, some Bible teachers believe. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. There's arguments on both sides. But verse 10, later in verse 10, it says, The court was seated and the books were opened. Can you just picture that? Can you picture this, this huge figure all dressed in white sitting on this fiery throne and there's thousands of angels around him? And the angel, he makes, gives an order and some angels come with these huge books and they open them before the throne. And here is the judge. And remember, these books are symbols. In ancient times, the royal court of a nation would record events. So they would record daily events or historical events. They would keep a record. So in keeping with the context of this verse, it seems that these books expose the evils of the four beasts. And God has recorded that these beasts, these beasts are worthy of judgment. And we keep reading, we would see the fourth beast or the king or the kingdom is slain in the very next verse. Judgment is carried out. So what are we to make of this frightening scene? It tells us that those responsible for evil will be held to account. And in our world, there are many injustices, and, and maybe you've been on the receiving end of some of that injustice. Just know that someday you'll be vindicated. One of our team members, back to our Dominican Republic missions trip, one of our team members was from Calgary, and he had been involved in the oil industry. He told a story about how he was hired by a, a U.S. oil company to start up a branch in Canada. It was a very high-powered position, a huge paycheck involved, and so he was hired with them and he started. And after a while, he noticed that the company was sending billions of dollars through their Canadian company and to some offshore bank account. And so when he inquired about it, they told him, oh, don't worry about that. 
And it didn't take long, and it became apparent that something illegal was going on, and the company was trying to cover it up. And exactly a year to the day after he started, he had to quit because he said his Christian faith would not allow him to get involved in such an illegal activity. He gave up his high-paying job, the steady job, because of his faith, and he went from having, making a lot of money to zero. And he had a mortgage, he had a family, he had a wife and kids, he had payment, car payments and so on. Later this company came under investigation and he, my friend was fairly certain that no one ever went to jail. Boy, that seems unfair. And here the honest guy is the one who comes out with nothing. One day those evils, those injustices in this world will be held accountable. And God will make all the wrongs right. Evil will be destroyed. This courtroom, this courtroom vision, and we can see there's a, there's a parallel actually from the courtroom vision that is parallel with a courtroom scene in Revelation 20. It's a scene that looks into the future. And you can turn there if you want. I'm going to read it. Revelation 20. This is at the end of time. Revelation 20, and I'm going to start at verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, and he recorded... As, as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and the death and death and Hades gave up their dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Now this may be the most sobering passage in all of the Bible. It tells of a day is coming when every person who has ever lived will be held accountable for how they lived on this earth. Each of us will stand before God's throne of judgment. Verse 12 says, the books will be opened. Now the books may be literal, they may be symbolic, a reference to God's memory of our deeds and our thoughts and our actions and our words. Our destiny is determined by whether or not our name is written in the book of life. The book of life is a, a heavenly record with the names of those who have accepted Jesus as their Savior, meaning those who have confessed that they have sinned and are in need of Jesus' forgiveness. None of us can live up to God's perfect standard. None of us. And that's why we need someone to save us from the consequences of sin. And the consequences of sin is that a relationship with God has been broken. The only way to reconcile or restore that relationship is to believe that Jesus erased the punishment of our sin when he was executed on a Roman cross over 2,000 years ago. Christ's death paid the penalty of our sin and made us righteous or right with God. It's the best gift anyone could ever give. Because if you truly believe that, your name is written in the book of life. There's no way to earn your name to be written in the book of life. It's not by praying five times a day or wearing all black or, or going door to door witnessing for two years or buying it or any kind of good deed. Although someone has rightly said, deeds are seen as clear evidence of a person's actual relationship with God, but simply believe in Him. Believe in Him and His sacrifice for you on the cross and follow the purpose that He has for your life, and I had mentioned it earlier. And so my question for you is, if God opened the record of your life today, what would it look like? Christian brothers and sisters, 
How have you handled the opportunities, the privileges, the responsibilities that God has given you? How have you used the spiritual gift that you were given when you committed your life to Him? Because one day we will be held accountable for how we lived on this earth. And how terrifying it will be for anyone whose name is not written in the book of life. Because they will face the wrath of God. Verse 15 in Revelation 20 says they will be thrown into the lake of fire. That's God honoring their decision to reject His Son. Eternal separation in a horrible place. And there's no appeal. There's no second chance. And so, my friends, do not leave this building today without the assurance that your name is written in the book of life. You can come and talk to me after. The pastors will be around. We'll be around a little longer today because of the lunch. Please come and talk to us if you have any questions or or doubts. That name, Ancient of Days, that's, it's a strange and wonderful name. It's an indication that He is eternal, which means that He's our Creator. He made us. There's purpose in our life. And that should give us hope within this world that sometimes seems so bleak. Ancient, ancient of Days is the Almighty Judge, and one day He will execute His justice. And we long for justice, don't we? We may not experience it in our lifetime, but be assured that the righteous justice of God is coming. The Ancient of Days. It's a name of hope. It's a name of justice. So let's sing about the Ancient of Days, and I'm going to ask the music team to come up and lead us in a closing song.